Okay, well, I would like to welcome you all along tonight. I've been very, very excited about this. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Darren Morton. I'm the Director of the Lifestyle Medicine and Health Research Centre here at Avondale. And uh, we have some guests with us, but uh, this presentation is specifically part of a, a module that's being taught in the Lifestyle Medicine course here at Avondale. Um, I, as I said, I'm very, very excited about this because tonight's presenter, I have the greatest admiration for it's Dr. Cameron McDonald. And I'll tell you why I admire him so much in just a moment, but I, I broke this news to him a, a little while back and I don't know if he's, he's recovered from it or not yet, but one of my, one of my friends said to me, one of my colleagues, he, he was there and, and I said, yeah, that, that Dr. Cam, he, he, rem he sort of reminds me a little bit of you. He's, he's more intelligent and better looking and younger, but he does remind me a little bit of you. And you know what? I took that as a wonderful compliment. So uh, that says a lot. What I, I love about um, Cam, and you'll get this, he, two things in particular, and, and there are many others, but number one, he is super passionate. And in fact, even on his website, you'll see that he, he describes uh, himself as a crusader, um, and, and he's a crusader for, for, for on a mission, you know, to make a real difference. And what I love is, and this, this is, you know, so common in the lifestyle medicine space, you meet these capable, caring, passionate people who are incredibly talented and gifted and yet are really passionate about rolling those gifts and talents into making a difference in the world. And so I love, I love that about you, Cam, and, and, and the way that you go about that. The other thing that I really admire about Cam is um, his ability to, to make really complex concepts and you know, scientific constructs simple and palatable to, the, to everyday people you know who don't have and so you don't need the the high level you know an in-depth understanding of the topic you can have some good strong takeaways from it and what people often don't recognize is that I you know I, as what I when I see a communicator to be able to do that be able to take difficult concepts and and bring them and package them in a way that is meaningful to, to everyone that's a real gift that's a real talent and it's actually it's 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 more difficult to do that than to present it at the highbrow level often. So really appreciate what you do with that, Ken. And, uh, and you're gonna to get to demonstrate that. You're going to uh, be exposed to that tonight as he presents this, this topic, which I don't know, when you, when you saw the, the topic, epigenetics, personalized medicine, you're probably thinking, oh, <laughs> oh no, where, where are we gonna start with this? This is gonna be challenging. But, um, but I think you're just gonna find this absolutely fascinating. Uh, Dr. Cam is the CEO, Australian, uh, CEO of the Australian PH360 uh, and it's a really innovative way of thinking about how we do health and how we do wellbeing. Uh, so he's a very sought after speaker and you'll see why in just a moment. But yeah, it's a pleasure to have, it, have you with us Cam and um, we really look forward to what you have to share. Take it away. Sorry. Jeez, Darren, that is probably the most glowing introduction I've ever had. I feel a little bit special now. Thank you. Did you know how to... <laughs> Make a boy feel nice. So um, firstly, I wanted to really just say uh, a really dear thank you to the availability to be able to present. Um, I, I've been through a number of universities in my dietetics, ex-phys and then PhD years. And um, just the interaction with, with uh, everything that's happened so far, I've been incredibly grateful for it and always grateful for this opportunity. So thank you so much. Thanks Mel for your support as well. Um, so tonight uh, we have personalized health and the future of it and, and what it is. Um, we're gonna go through some, we, like, like Darren said, some more complex um, uh, principles, but hopefully we'll be able to make them nice and simple for you. And I'd love to just give you a little bit of a background into me. Um, I started out as an exercise physiologist or at least learning to be an exercise physiologist, looking to avoid as much university as possible through various social endeavors at university. And in my third year, I got hooked. I um, had a a, um, a, a lecturer that was talking about how you can reverse um, chronic disease or diabetes in this case with exercise. And I was like, why is everyone not exercising? This seems like easily the best thing to do, easily. Why, why aren't we all doing it? So I got on a mission in my crusader way to go and eliminate diabetes. Um, and so I said, well, if I need to know about diabetes, I need to know a bit about nutrition. So I went off and did my master's uh, of dietetics, got into hospital, um, I was given a cardiac rehabilitation talk. I was meant to take 15 minutes on it. Um, I took an hour, uh, which was exciting for me, but not so much for everybody else. 
And I just got really interested in there is so much that we can do with food and exercise that can eliminate disease. And through that, you know, I got linked up with the Australian Society of Lifestyle Medicine and um, did my PhD in breast cancer survivorship, omega-3 and exercise and how they recovered. But what I really noticed was that um, I was giving the right information to people, but I, what I thought was the right information, but they weren't getting a consistent result. They weren't coming back and saying, this is exactly as the study said it would be. I'm improving my blood sugar levels. I'm improving my whatever. It was all quite random. And so I started searching for personalization and I <clears throat> essentially have spent the last six years um, doing just that, working only with applied epigenetics and a company called PH360. And um, over that time, I've been able to talk to and interact with some of the most brilliant minds on the planet that are trying to uh, fix world health. And um, this is essentially the, uh, the regurgitation of some of those things that I've been learning over the last years and, and how we need to be thinking about personalized health. Um, because I'm a true believer in personalized medicine or lifestyle medicine, I should say. Um, and tonight, hopefully, you'll start to see that this is a lot more than just applying what is currently in the literature, but it's, it's about understanding the person in front of us. And so I wanted to make this practical. And tonight we have John. I just made that name up then. He's a 55-year-old man, elevated waist circumference, higher triglycerides and blood sugar levels. He's a sedentary office worker. He grazes through the day, sometimes on chocolate, sometimes on food that's just biscuits, whatever. Take away a couple of times a day, three beers, four times per week. So he gets home and has a few beers from Thursday through to Sunday. And so this is the client that you wait for as a practitioner because you go, you are every single risk factor. There is so many ways that I can interact with you to make sure that you get the best result ever. You are going to be my pinup child, the person who I am able to apply this lifestyle medicine to and get the result finally. And so obviously uh, what we do is we go to the guidelines. And um, the reason why we go to the guidelines is because, you know, or, or is because these conditions are lifestyle related. We are incredibly good at saving people from, from dying in, in emergency, but we are quite bad at keeping them alive and healthy with our current culture. We, we don't have a solution for chronic disease in the medication uh, department. We have uh, symptom management. And the uh, most amazing thing about lifestyle medicine is that pretty much when you apply it, you get a dose response relationship. That is the more that you do of something, the more adherent you are to a healthy intake, the more adherent you are to uh, your exercise, the more adherent you are to better sleep, et cetera, et cetera there is a progressively uh, decreased risk of disease. There is a, um, normally an improvement in symptoms, but the very important thing uh, about that is the normal part. Normally we see these things. You know, so much of our, our death is related to these preventable conditions. And so um, what we need to do is, is lifestyle essentially, and this is why it's so important. So we have these incredible guidelines. We have the Australian Guide to Healthy Eating. We have Mediterranean guidelines as well, which is a there's incredible literature base behind that as well for nutrition. We then have these physical activity guidelines for the whole world, you know, 150 minutes of exercise per day or per, per week, I should say, 75 minutes of vigorous intensity, you know, make sure that kids are getting a bit more, make sure that you're um, getting a bit of strength activity happening as well and we'll be pretty set. And of course you're thinking, yeah, that sounds great. Like this is, I've just got to apply this stuff. We've just got to get people moving. We've just got to get people eating the right food. And so this is exactly what happens. We get a client, we've got John here, and we run him through a 12-week kind of lifestyle intervention uh, as a starting point for him. Um, two to three centimeters off his waist, that's some, that's some modest good change. We get a slight reduction in triglycerides, but there's no real change in blood sugar levels, which, you know, it surprises a little bit, but, you know, there's some other change elsewhere. And so maybe this is a good thing. And so he joined a morning cycle class, which is really good and he's really loving it. And then he's grazing through the day, more fruits, more vegetables. Um, that's, a, that's a real positive, less takeaway. And also, um, you know, instead of takeaway two pint times a day, takeaway once a week. Beer on the weekends only. So he's only doing six, not, uh, not 16. This is all pretty good. So, but then we catch up with him 26 weeks. You know, we're, we're half a year through it now and he's plateaued from his original results. And if you are in practice, some of you may not be in practice, some of you might be, but if you're in practice, not only is this a very, very common outcome, but this is a, an outcome that we dread. <clears throat> that is, we're watching someone who swears they are doing everything by the book. Oh, you know what? I've really increased my veggies. 
I'm eating the foods, I'm doing the exercise, and they turn up to jump on the scales or get that waist measure or get their bloods tested, and they just aren't shifting the way that you would expect it. And it is not only, it's diabolical for your, for your confidence in what you're doing because you're thinking, well, what could be the problem here? And the really great thing that we're doing at this point is we point the finger back at the client and say, <clears throat> you, um, it's your fault. You haven't adhered. You're obviously lying to me about your food intake. You don't have enough patience. You've just got to go to the long haul, but two to three centimeters off your waist in six months for all of this commitment of energy, it's, it's a bit frustrating. And you could see why people go, well, you know, I could just have a slightly high waist circumference and enjoy all of the foods that I enjoy. Is it that big a deal? Um, you know, you could say they're not making enough change but then they insist that they are, or you're not motivated enough, but then they insist that, you know, I have been doing it and there are some good things. And you can see how you can really demonize the client <clears throat> because it's their fault that their body hasn't changed. But this is the really important thing about personalization. The first step is that we need to understand is population guidelines, just like you need to do this much exercise versus, um, uh, you know, BMI, you know, BMI on a population is a, wonderful tool when you've got a million people and you apply bmi you see some incredible relationships but when it comes down to the individual the only person that matters is not all of the thousand of people that were in the study it matters for the person that was in front of you and there is a large percentage of these individuals that are considered non-responders and this is one of your clients they have not responded two to three centimeters off a, off a person's waist with no change in blood sugar levels with a slight reduction in triglycerides clinically is not a result and we should be expecting a much bigger result for us to say, yes, I've treated this person properly. So <clears throat> we have to reconcile this difference of why are people not getting a result? And this non-responder thing is everywhere. So we look at statins. Statins are profoundly effective at reducing cholesterol levels. Now, how much they reduce heart disease as a result is up to the numbers. However, not everyone gets a better LDL cholesterol result from taking a statin. Some people you can see here still increase their LDL cholesterol when they're taking the drug. This is accounting for adherence. They're taking the drug, but not getting the effect. We also have a look at how a person would respond to a nutritional input. This is a bunch of different people eating exactly the same meal and their blood sugar response. All other things are equal. Obviously the person, the people are not equal, but the, the meal is exactly the same for everyone. And look at the difference in these blood sugar levels. Some people don't even go up at all. Other people skyrocket through into a very unhealthy range. These are people with a baseline of, of health. And so hugely different responses in drugs, in the way nutrients hit our body. So straight away, our confidence in should everyone get the same thing is starting to decline a little bit and we may need to start looking a little bit deeper. We then look at exercise. This is by far the most profound study. Obviously there's been more done since then, but it was so powerful for its time and still is. This is a study of 500 individuals, families, multiple people in each family um, that got six months or 20 weeks of uh, aerobic training, bike training. They had to ride a bike for uh, 45 minutes, three times per week. And they were doing it specifically to improve their aerobic fitness, their cardiovascular fitness, otherwise known as their VO2 max, which is a marker of that. What they found after 20 weeks, some individuals increased their VO2 by 1100 mils. This is a ridiculous increase in their VO2. This is very, very high super responder, we call them. Then the average was around about 393 mils. So we could say from this study that aerobic training jumping on a bike three times a week for 20 weeks will increase your VO2 by 393 mils. And then we have this portion of individuals over here who are battling away on their bike, doing exactly the same training as everyone else. They are actually adhering to the protocol. And what do we see? We see some people return a negative effect on their VO2, get worse with their VO2. So have they've done 20 weeks of training, and I'd like you to put yourself into their shoes for a second, 20 weeks of training to get no result or not feel good and actually get a lower result than what you said. Like, who would want that result? And you can have a look at this. Non-responders are actually quite numerous. So this is a real thing. And imagine being this person and not knowing that you're about to start on 20 weeks of exercise training and not get a result, not get an improvement in your VO2, which is a very important risk factor for heart disease. 
Then they also looked at the glycemic index and how, or the glycemic indices following this 20 weeks as well. Some people dramatically improved their blood sugar levels. Other people didn't improve their, their glycemic response. So exercise is normally touted as it is the panacea of diabetes. This is what my belief was, that if you apply exercise, you will get an improvement in blood sugar levels. But a, a structured exercise intervention creates so much variability in the results. You have to wonder, why are these people not getting a result? And then we have something like HIIT training that came out. HIIT training was everything. When I, just before my PhD, I was reading every single article I could on HIIT training because it was just kind of starting to hit the literature. When they collected all of these uh, studies in 2019, essentially, if you put a group of people through high volume HIIT training or low volume HIIT training, it doesn't matter, 31% of them will be likely responders. 35 will be likely non-responders and 33% will be uncertain. Essentially, someone comes in to say, yeah, I'm pumped up, I'm ready to go exercise. And oh, great, HIIT training is meant to be really, really good, really high intensity, I can do it for a shorter period of time, knowing that 66% of people will not necessarily get a result from all of this effort that they're putting in. This is the thing, people don't want choice. They don't want, oh, you can do anything you like. They want, what is the thing that's going to work for me? And as we can see here, the same exercise does not affect people the same way. And in fact, some cases, it creates more injury, more, uh, more risk. And so we have this situation where we have non-responders to both nutrition, exercise, drug therapies, a whole lot of things um, that are taking up, when we approach them with lifestyle medicine and generic lifestyle medicine, which is recommended from the literature, which is completely acceptable, there is a good chance that some of those people will not get the result that they're hoping for. And then that demotivates them from engaging further. And the whole game of everything that we are doing is to how can I get people to live healthy forever? How do I do that? And getting them no result is not one of the ways that we can do that. And so we end up with a very frustrated population that are giving, being given recommendations that aren't specific to them. And so if we tailor the prescription, we should get a response. That's the idea. If we tailor it to the person rather than the generic average, if we tailor it to the person, we should find what helps them respond. That's the principle. And so I wanted to this point, just tangent a second as to maybe why we're seeing some non-response. And one of the most underappreciated principles of, of lifestyle medicine is without a doubt chronobiology. Chronobiology, I'm just going to touch on it for a few slides and then we're going to jump into the background of personalized health. But it is a, uh, a particularly profound field of science that looks at how our body interacts with time. Uh, we like to go to sleep at night. We like to wake up in the morning and do stuff during the day. And if we disrupt that very simple cycle, the longer that you do night shift, the more weight gain that you gather and the more chronic disease you put yourself at risk. If you get out of sync with daylight uh, and nighttime cycles, straight away it increases your disease. But we also have clocks, not just a clock in our brain that's telling light and dark, but we also have a clock in our gut telling us when it's meal time or in our muscles telling us when it's exercise time. And we have uh, preferred timings to do certain things throughout the day based on our biology. One of the most fascinating studies that really started a lot of this to really hit mainstream was they looked at individuals who had a valve replacement in their heart in the afternoon or the morning. And what they found is that there was a 50% reduction of significant cardiac events following individuals who had their afternoon surgery compared to those who had morning surgery. There was a 50% reduction between those two groups just based on when the surgery was done, how our body recovers, what hormones are available to us at that time for recovery and rest. And this got everyone in the medical world thinking about, geez, what, is, what else is timing involved with? And what we know is that symptoms of every disease will rise and fall, peak and the deer throughout the day based on the tissue that's involved with that disease, the condition that it is, and the system that's associated with its pathophysiology. So chronobiology is really, really telling us how our body should operate in time and gives us a guideline into uh, when should we apply something that's going to have a more profound effect? Not just through the day, but also there is such thing as a circannular rhythm. What you may or may not know is that your blood pressure is more likely to be higher, your cholesterol is more likely to be higher, and your insulin resistance is more likely to be higher in winter than it is in summer. The time of year influences our health. Uh, this isn't things that we speak about too much. In fact, we don't speak about it much at all. But if you go in and get your regular heart checkup in winter, there is a greater chance that you will be diagnosed with 
cardiovascular disease or pre pre diabetes uh, earlier in the year, like earlier, oh sorry, in winter I should say, than you would be in summer with those markers naturally falling again. So we have this really powerful modifier of what our health is doing at any one point in time, yet we don't talk about it too much. Well, you're going to be talking about it more after this slide. So applied chronobiology. This is a population of individuals with type 2 diabetes who were told to do HIIT training in the morning or HIIT training in the afternoon. HIIT training in the morning uh, is represented, their blood sugar levels are represented by this red line right here. If they did HIIT training in the morning, it dysregulated their blood sugar levels so much so that they were higher throughout the rest of the day. Whereas in the afternoon, if they did that same exact training, they did a crossover in this study. If they did that same exact training in the afternoon, they saw significantly better blood sugar levels throughout the day, whereas the gray line is doing no activity at all. In this study, it was shown that HIIT training in the morning worsened blood sugar levels more than doing no activity on that day, which we get a little bit worried when we hear about that as lifestyle medicine experts, but it's not to say that exercise is bad. It's just to say you've got to do it at the right time. And there could be a bad time to do it. And the reason why that is, is because it's not about whether exercise is good or not. It's about, is this stress appropriate for this body? Exercise is just a stress. If you apply it at the right time, you get a great recovery. But if you go for an ultra marathon run for four weeks and don't stop, your body will fall apart. That's because exercise is a stress. It's the application and the, the expression of hormones that are destructive for your body if prolonged. And you can do that same thing. You can disturb your body the same way in exercising at the wrong time. And we see that just by eating meals overnight, it significantly influences your, your weight and your metabolic disease risk with shift work. So that's one example of why we need to, why we may have non-responders who are doing exercise regularly. It's just the time of day. It's got nothing to do with the type of exercise they were doing. Then we have nutrient timing, whereas there was a number of studies that have repeated this, looking at six meals per day versus two meals per day. When you eat exactly the same macro or micronutrients, um, they, they spread the meals over breakfast and lunch only, or three meals and three snacks. And what they found was that the two meals per day in a population, and it's predominantly only been done in, in pre-diabetes or, or polycystic ovarian syndrome, where there's some sort of insulin resistance playing a part. What they found was that the weight loss was significantly greater in the two meals per day. The uh, hepatic fatty content was also, this is the, the fat that you're accumulating in your liver, significantly decreased as well uh, in, a, in a greater amount. And there was also uh, fasting plasma glucose, was significantly greater as well. There was a number of other changes that essentially said there's a, a two-fold improvement going two meals versus six. Now, we don't often consider this. Oh, if I eat good food and healthy food, then I'll be sweet. Well, no, because your body is different through the day. You're more insulin resistant at night. It's a time when your body is less able to process proteins and carbohydrates effectively, particularly if you've already got a background of insulin sensitivity or insulin resistance problems. Whereas, in the earlier in the day, you're much more insulin sensitive. And so having lots of spikes of insulin throughout the day for someone who's insulin resistant, it's, it, it supports them in holding more weight on. So even the same exact food, this is the very important thing, just eaten at different times of day will determine the level of response for some individuals. And so I, I digressed into this small example because it's these considerations that we aren't making in lifestyle medicine at the moment. Generally in the literature, this is a beautiful thing that's coming is that the chronobiology literature is really expanding and a lot more of it will be hitting it, but you need to be across these principles if we're really going to consider the individual. And so we need to have a shift towards personalization. And this idea that probably the most important takeaway from all of tonight is that it is not whether any lifestyle medicine intervention is good or bad. It is about whether it's appropriate for the person. The example that I'll give you, is this individual right here. She decided to go on a health kick. She moved up into the mountains to be in the pine forests. She um, started eating, like doing her green juices and lots of olives, lots of healthy foods each day uh, and found that her, her health went through the floor, it plummeted. Um, and it turns out that her body was particularly sensitive to altitude. So she had to move lower. That was one of the, her features in geomedicine. The other feature that she had as well is that when her body is under some sort of stress, she doesn't process salicylates too well. And so a high salicylate food, like your olives or other foods that are really high in antioxidants, some antioxidants, 
they actually created hives for her and significantly suppressed her energy levels. So we would normally say this food is the best food that you could have. It's high in this, high in this, high in this, but it's not appropriate for her. And so while it may be true for somebody, it may be quite a different story for somebody else. And so if only you, if the only thing that I want you to take out of tonight is when you see someone and when you notice them, um, notice, know that they are different and know that what is going to be most appropriate for them right now is going to be different to the person next to them. And a simple example is you wake up and you feel tired because you only got three hours sleep. You're a very different person to uh, when you have eight hours sleep and how you'll tolerate exercise, how you'll tolerate food choices. It's a completely different game. The advice you give to someone who's tired is going to be very different to the same version of that person the next day after they sleep well. And so whether you're coaching, whether you're applying lifestyle medicine, exercise, nutrition, uh, sleep, whatever it might be, meditation, it is about, is this appropriate for this person right now? Uh, is this the right strategy? This is the, the, the lens that we need to be coming from. Not, oh, you're meant to be doing exercise, just do it harder, or you're not motivated, just apply this more. That's often not the case. The case is that we haven't understood what this body needs. Uh, and this is exactly what we want to be talking about right now is how do we define the individual to know that it, this is the right strategy for them? And so how we need to define it is firstly with the genetics. So we need to understand the DNA, but we also need to understand how has that DNA expressed itself? Because someone with diabetes with a very large waist circumference is a very different body and needs very different things to that same body that's now a marathon runner and has been training for the last five years. Their tolerance of glucose, their tolerance of fuel, their energy levels, so many things will be different even though they've got the same exact genetic information. And so yes, we need to understand genes, but we also need to understand the environment that the, the, the effect of the environment and what that's done to that body over time. And even you can be a certain genotype with diabetes and that same genotype without diabetes, but we need to treat the diabetes when it's there. This is why it's not just about treating the genes, but rather the phenotype, which is the combination of the genes plus the environment. And so the phenotype is everything that we can measure. Pretty much everything outside of the little chromosome found in your nucleus, everything else is a phenotype that's been created through uh, the construction of proteins, which has all happened from the coding of the genes, which only happens when you expose your genes to the environment. If you just put the genes down on a shelf and never provided any stimulus to it, they do nothing. It's the environment that brings the genes alive. And so it relates to our metabolic function. Our fitness levels will be governed by the environment around us. Our chronotype, our psychological variables are actually part of our phenotype as well. Whether we're angry or sad is a phenotype. And so in order to get personalization and really understand it we need to understand the history of personalization essentially we started back in constitutional medicine 5000 years ago um, essentially what constitutional medicine is all about is um, there is a certain structure an essence to a person and that has a predictable way of responding to the environment we have uh, different constitutions will respond differently to the same environment and it, it formed uh, the, the knowledge base through observation. Um, they essentially collected data. Now, what was fascinating about this, Chinese medicine, it's been around for 5,000 years. Some, there's some trace back to um, the, the, in the Neanderthal times, actually. There's some uh, you know, amateur aspirin found in Neanderthal teeth. And there's considerations that personalized medicine even went back that far. Well, essentially, the Chinese medicine got very good at quantifying the environment, quantifying uh, the person. And they also, similar to Ayurveda and Hippocratic medicine, uh, used the four humors as opposed to the five elements in the other models. All of these uh, models essentially said, we have different types of people and they respond differently to the different elements of the environment, to the relationships, to the, uh, to the, um, to the temperature that it might be, to the season that, that it might be, excuse me. Um, and even though there was very little communication in these times over this span of 3000 years, they actually came up with very, very similar models without much communication between any of those different regions of, of, of the planet. So really incredible that they could all come to the same conclusion after thousands of years of observation. Um, and this is where we started because it, back in even Chinese medicine, Hippocratic medicine, all of these factors were considered part of the environment. It wasn't just, well, I'll get your diet straight and that'll sort you out or let's get your exercise right. It was, it was a holistic approach. What, what is this person about? 
what's, what's the way that they approach life? And so how are they going to be affected by the various things? They're actually incredibly holistic with the way they looked at things because people weren't separate to the rest of the environment. They considered them part of the environment. We're made up of elements. The sun is made up of elements. Everyone's just made up of elements. And so we're just operating within this ecosystem as opposed to um, just our health, just being our business in our little apartment. It's, it's uh, a lot more reductionist is what we do now. And so, we have this constitutional medicine that went right through, was still being taught in universities in the 1600s, right up into the 1920s. But in, in Western medicine, excuse me, what we did was instead of doing elemental medicine in the late 1890s, just soon after Mendel, this is the guy right here in the 1850s, decided that he could just start determining dominant and recessive genes. Um, we had Akia Di Giovanni and Nicola Pender, this guy right here, uh, who started using anthropometry to quantify the body. And what they found was that uh, Akia Di Giovanni wrote one of the really important texts on this in 1893, 1891, I should say. And um, what they discovered is that they would take thousands of subjects, measure their body in very specific ways, understand the size and shape, their morphology, and then say, right, what diseases are they presenting with? And one of the examples that they came up with, they came up with many, but one of them was that people who are a lot more slender with a lighter skeleton, less muscle tissue and less fat tissue had a much greater risk of dying from tuberculosis. And they found that these individuals generally were less resilient to things that placed a large demand on the body physically. And so much so, this was so well evidenced back in these times that they actually changed the way that people would be recruited to the army. They would not allow someone in if they had a very small chest cavity. A smaller chest cavity was representative of this type of structure, very light, very slender. And they knew that this individual, when they went to war, would come back in much worse aware than somebody else who has a much stronger physiology, a thicker trunk, or a more substantial body generally. And so these skinny people, let's just call them, don't ever develop into large sumo wrestlers. That's just not their, the way that their body develops. They have a different metabolic function to the way somebody accumulates mass in the sumo wrestling space. And so uh, these are inbuilt uh, characteristics that governed how they made decisions back in those days. And then Nicola Pender came along in the 1920s and he uh, was the first, or one of the first to develop a, a school for biotypology, which is essentially how a body shapes and forms tells us about how that body functions. And they studied in that time over 10,000 individuals and they had a look into uh, how a body is, um, uh, how a body shape and size determines how it grows. And a lot of what we know actually comes from endocrinology because they discovered that people have got different size and shape. Therefore, um, they must have a different level of whatever, something, substance inside them that's actually changing how they grow. And it was through the, un it was actually through body shape and differences in body shape where endocrinology came from. So then we progressed, we, we went from constitutional medicine into anthropometrics, and then we essentially came across germ theory, antibiotic treatment, we came across genetics, epigenetics, and since then, we've been searching for understanding what is the, the very, very fine bit, what is the very small component to, that makes us up, that determines our health, and our search into genetics and epigenetics has occurred. And so I hope to help you understand a bit about genetics and epigenetics, we have proteins or little base, chemical base pairs in our body. And what happens is these form in pairs, and then they join in chains, and the chains become the DNA. Then the DNA wraps around these little blue things called histones. And then these histones gather together to form our chromosome. And so let's say that you walk into a fridge and this is your cold gene right here, the, the gene that responds to cold. Let's just give a crude example. Um, when you're out in normal temperature, this gene, the histones pack around it and it can't be read, it can't be copied. But what happens when you walk into the cold, it acetylates some of these histones and unravels them. So now this gene can be accessed and now it's active and turns on and makes you shiver, for example. So we have this, these genes, but you might have genes for diabetes, but they're not turned on because you've got the right environment around you. So it's not actually about the genes that you have, it's about the genes that you're expressing. And so now it becomes a matter of, well, what genes are we expressing in any moment in time? And then once we've figured out what gene that we've got, let's say that we've got this, this a diabetes gene, one diabetes gene that codes for your insulin release, for example, or your pancreatic function. But then there's three other genes that are associated with pancreatic function. And then there's 
20 or 30 other genes that are associated with uh, the rest of your insulin signaling, for example. And now you have to understand that not only what is this gene doing when it's cold or when it's warm or you've got carbohydrates or when you've got protein or when you've got fats or when you've got exercise or when you don't have enough exercise or you've got exercise at the wrong time, one gene is going to change its function. And then all of the other genes are also going to change their function too. And this is essentially where computers start blowing up. We get this understanding of we have all of these beautiful genes now, these 25,000 odd genes with hundreds of thousands of single nucleotide polymorphisms that are the variants of those genes. And we're trying to understand how do they all fit together. We have gone to the reductionist end point of personalized health, where we've gone from these top-down principles of constitution right down into, and we've discovered through incredible uh, uh, methodologies how our body is put together at a basic level. It's incredible. But unless we have the map of how this comes together to try and say this gene plus this gene plus this gene in this environment equals this times 25,000 plus all of the gene interactions, it's, in, it's too complex. And even with AI, you need to be able to code this information so that AI can start interpreting it. And so there is such a job in trying to be a reductionist and understand personalized health because there are so many moving parts. So this is where phenotype can become really interesting and where anthropometry catches back up with genetics. We know that someone who's taller has a higher risk of all of these cancers. Height is associated with cancer. That's weird. And when we're looking at studies, they just control for height. And so we say, okay, well, height's just a given. But why is height associated with cancer? Because height is very genetically determined. And so by understanding the height, we get an understanding of the genes someone has. Maybe we start understanding now the genes that are associated with cancer. And we can start to understand why these individuals have a higher risk of cancer just by understanding an anthropometric indice rather than trying to understand every single little gene in between. We then also have a, a neck circumference. The, the, the neck is quite stable. It doesn't change too much, but it is an independent risk factor for type two diabetes in the future. Even if you've got a flat waist circumference, you've got a really good waist, you've been working out, you're doing the right things. If you've got a thicker neck, you've still got an increased risk of diabetes because the, the structures and hormones and gene expressions that are related to a thicker neck in normal function also, when it comes to uh, imbalance and out of homeostasis, the way that a body like that goes into disease is into insulin resistance. Whereas a person with a skinny neck who's really tall, they may not get diabetes, but they might get cancer instead. So each person will have their own way of diseasing or finding health. Um, and it, this is actually found in size and shape of the body. And so we have a low BMI, like the skinnier a person is, the, the greater risk of Alzheimer's they have but the greater your abdominal or waist circumference, the most common measure, still from anthropometry, uh, you're more likely to get to type 2 diabetes. And then, not just are these associations found with disease, but they're also found with um, size and shape of the body. There are genetics related to how big your trunk is, how long your legs are, how tall you are, your waist to hip ratio, your, your levels of obesity are all related to genes. Your shape, your, your morphology, which is essentially what they're referring to in constitutional health is the size and shape, the general size and shape of people is actually related to genetics. And so what we've found, our journey of personalization has been one of constitution, the expansionist view of, oh, the sun's hot, so fire is an element. Okay, and now that ant just bit me. That ant must have fire in it too because it's hot as well. This person seems to inflame a lot more and they seem hot-tempered they must have fire in them. We've come from this very expansionist elemental version of health. And that's now been condensed down and redu redu reduced into Zengomics and aeogenomics. This is where there have been literally millions of papers uh, produced in China, which is not always recognized by Western medicine. Some of them are coming across now to Western medicine where they are validating Chinese elemental types with genetic uh, information now. And they do an incredible amount of research in all of the omics uh, the metabolomics, the proteomics, all of those, and they validate them against not only their, their elemental types, but also their, uh, their, their herbs and spices and, and why they work that way too. So there's an incredible literature that's come out of this expansionist thinking is now becoming a lot more reductionist. And we, on the other hand, in the Western society, have been trying to find our way up to this. And what we're finding now is understanding the base units of things was very important 
but now we're coming back to these broad structures, anthropometry, morphology, and big data to try and, try and understand that these genes do not work individually, but rather they work in clusters. And so this is a perfect example, just to bring a few things together, of constitutional genetics. And I'm just sort of throwing that term out there with a big question mark. But I want you to start having a think about uh, these three individuals right here. Now, when we talk about sports, uh, sports performance, there are definitely some genes that are associated with greater elite performance, particularly power and sprint performance. And that is the, uh, the ACTN3 gene. Now, of these individuals, uh, I'm just gonna get yourself to ask yourself a question, is which of these individuals do you think has the, the sprint performance gene? And you would probably be thinking, well, it's these two out in front, surely they are crushing it. Well, it turns out that all three of them have this gene. It just so happens that we have a different constitution around that one gene. This is one gene cannot determine a health outcome. Or oh, actually, I, I take that back. There are some conditions that are purely related to one gene polymorphism um, or, or mutation. But generally for lifestyle and, and the general population, uh, it is a combination of our genes. Now, this person has the power gene. This is going to help them lift up a big heavy weight, or at least it's going to allow them to exert force quickly. But the rest of their physiology, they have a prolactin dominance. They have insulin that's releasing, maybe more insulin resistance. They have more growth hormone that's allowed them to, as they've traveled through their life, increase the size and shape of their muscle cross-sectional area. This person will never have this cross-sectional area because their bones are genuinely bigger. Their tissues genuinely greater in capacity, more muscle. And so when we look at this person, we go, oh, they're not a 100 meter sprinter. They don't have the body for it. Well, you'd be exactly right. But they've got the genes for power, but the rest of their constitution says, well, you might be good at lifting really heavy things with all of that muscle that you've got and throwing it a long way and then resting. Because what we know is that strength is often is related to body weight just by itself versus these genes right here, they've got power, but they've got lightness. And so this allows them to sprint faster over a longer period of time and be less fatigued because they're not hauling so much mass. And so we have this idea of, yeah, you might understand the genes that you have, but if you don't understand the context within which that gene is found, then you're going to misrepresent what this person might do. You might say, oh, this person's got this gene, so let's put them into sprinting, when in fact, it's not the right sport for them at all based on the overall picture. And so what I've been uh, sort of really driving towards in this whole talk so far is, yes, we need to understand the person, we need to understand their context, but we cannot discard 5,000 years of constitutional medicine because there is a, an incredible amount of uh, knowledge that we can glean from these sciences. Now, I'm not saying that we need to take them at their word, we need to test them as we have uh, with the genomic side of things and understand why are they taking this shape and what do they have in common to do this? And we see clusters of genes around different shapes of bodies. And essentially we start seeing constitutional clusters of genes as we progress this literature as well. So hopefully you're getting the understanding that we need a top down and a bottom up approach. We need to understand the genes and we need to understand the overarching momentum of this body. And this momentum is very different to this momentum, uh, if that makes sense. And so when we get to now the practicalities of things is what are the things that we need to consider in personalized health in order to get the, the greatest effect out of them? We need to understand circadian rhythm and chronobiology, nutrigenomics and the individuality for nutrition, exercise genomics and how we're going to prefer exercise, endocrinology, your age and stage of life. So the hormones that you have, where you are in life, your geomedicine and your ancestry. So you take a bucket load of people whose ancestry developed in Northern Europe and you bring them out to an island with lots of sunlight and we wonder why uh, we're all struggling with melanoma or this is a high risk for Caucasians out in this country is because our genes developed in 90% cloud cover, not 90% sunlight. And so obviously our genes have got a mismatch with the environment. This is very important. Embryology, how we develop in the womb sets up phenotypical characteristics that carry through for the rest of our life. Anthropometry, exposomics, what we're exposed to in our environment, whether it be pollutants, whether it be um, uh, you know, green space and, and forest, neuropsychology and then science of signs and symptoms, which is semiotics. And I want to give you one example. Uh, and I know I'm going a little bit over time, but this is exciting. So I'm going to get you to stay with me. Um, we have one example of, I just want everyone to have a look at your ring finger or your index finger. So you have your ring, if you've got a longer ring finger, 
This means that you're exposed to more testosterone endocrinology during embryological development. And when you're exposed to more testosterone during embryology, it changes the way you develop. It changes the length of your finger, for example. It actually changes an anthropometric mark. But what it also does is if you've got this mark and you're a male and it's particularly on your right hand, you are going to be more competitive, more aggressive. You're going to have a better spatial orientation. You're also going to be more successful reproductivity, reproductively. Um, and you're going to be uh, more likely, if you're an elite athlete, you're more likely to have this feature too. So I just want to walk you through that. Something that's happening in embryology that's endocrinologically related is related to anthropometry and is also associated with neuropsychology, the testosterone drives behavior, that competitiveness and the aggressiveness. And we also see a, pr a pr preference for uh, sporting and act activity endeavors as well. So we have this one feature, and this is another really important thing, is that we cannot isolate nutrition from exercise. We cannot isolate neuropsychology from hormones or, or circadian rhythms because they are all linked. We have to see it as one system rather than one discipline. And so this is a really great little study. This is the real start of personalized exercise prescription. And very briefly, what they had, they had people who were built for power. They had genes for power. Their genes, we find from research, are, are more powerful when they do an exercise versus people who have genes that are built for endurance. They have a greater preference to be a marathon runner. And what they did, they trained the power genes in power training and they trained the endurance genes in endurance training. And we saw an increase of both of power and endurance for both groups. Now, for those of you who don't do exercise physiology, this is a very strange result. Because if you train power for power, you would expect they get more powerful, but you wouldn't expect that their cardiovascular fitness would increase, but it did. Versus when you take the endurance trainer and you train them for endurance, their power also increased, even though they weren't trained for power. But interestingly, when they mismatched the groups, they took the endurance people and made them train for power, they got a lesser response on both markers. They didn't get as powerful and they didn't get as, as much endurance benefit. Similar for the power people, when they trained for endurance, they didn't get more, they didn't get more endurance improvements than when they trained power. They, the important thing out of this, if you didn't understand any of that, it's totally fine because it was aimed at exercise physiologists. If you train someone for power, you would expect they'll become more powerful. However, what we're finding is that if you train a set of genes for their strength, you will see improvements in multiple categories. But if you train them outside their strength, this is where 84% of the non-responders were found by mismatching the training. So it's not just the timing of training, it's actually the type of training that will matter as to how big a result that we're going to get. We then have differences in chronotypes. We have, this is genetically and phenotypically driven. We have some individuals that are great in the morning, some individuals that are great in the afternoon, and you will know a night owl, there is lots of them. Um, they will hate the morning and they will love the evening and they will despise the fact that everybody gets up early in Australia. But you go to another country where it's night owl central, where Spain or Italy or everything starts later and finishes later, they're in their happy place. It's just in uh, countries with our early bird culture, there's this social jet lag that sets up. What happens to a night owl that gets stressed well, firstly, let's talk about an early bird. When they do morning training, their stress levels go up and then straight back down and they recover really well. What happens to a night owl is their stress goes up higher, stays higher for longer, and then doesn't recover as well. And it dysregulates the rest of their day when it comes to blood sugar levels and also heart rate variability, which is an indicator of uh, many, many different conditions. So it isn't just a matter of understanding uh, you know, these sciences, it's a matter of understanding how does each person interact within each of these sciences as well. And it even extends into productivity. Some people are designed for early morning activity. Other people are designed for late night activity. And so we have all of these different features that now come into lifestyle medicine. It's a lot more complex than just trying to understand, oh, we just need to apply health and exercise. And I'm not saying that that's bad. That's a great start but we now have the science to say, we need to step this up. We need to make it more specific because it may not be appropriate for the person we are prescribing it to. And so a personalized lifestyle prescription 
essentially wouldn't just be, oh, do a morning cycle class. That's no good for John. John actually needs to join an evening strength class and do long, slow cardio because light walking, no problem. It actually improves the health when done in the morning, but the HIIT training and very hard training in the morning, not so good for him. Two to three meals per day, not six meals per day or five meals per day with a, you know, three with a couple of snacks. Understanding that this individual, it shouldn't just be what you eat, it's when you eat it. And then also what we see is when someone has a personalized prescription to them, their motivation improves as well. And I could speak to literally over a thousand clinical cases where I've worked with personalized health and applied these principles to the person to see significantly faster results, the two to three to four times faster than just applying a generic uh, approach to people. And this is something that, this is where we need to step into in five years, we'll be laughing at the fact that we gave the same exercise recommendations to everybody because we know that people are just so different and you not only need to ask them, oh, do you like early morning training? And they say, no, I hate it. And you go, oh, well, you should do it anyway because that's when I train people. You know, this is this mentality that our body's not sensitive to this, but it very much is. And it can make a profound difference to people. And so essentially, there are many ways of measuring uh, personalization. And PHO60 is the company that I work with and, and what I have a lot of involvement with. There are incredible places that you know, are measuring genes, interpreting gene samples, and understanding that <clears throat> lots of different ways to experience it. Um, but essentially what we need to understand as health professionals and as people of the public is that uh, it's not just a matter of the genes that you have or the state that you're in right now. It's also going to be the feedback that you are providing. We, we wear this watch and in six months, um, there's going to be an application that will remain nameless right now um, that will essentially say, oh, hey, Cam, uh, you've been stressed for the last two hours. You need to, um, to do some sort of meditation. I'm going to provide you music that's actually appropriate for your uh, neural patterns that is going to support you in relaxing so that you can recover your nervous system and then go on forward. There's going to, the, the information you're going to be able to log what food you've had. It's going to be able to tell you, oh, well, you did some exercise this morning. This is now a bigger meal that you need. Um, because these wearables are going to be coming into our life. Uh, they're going to be measuring us in real time. They're, they're measuring our gene expression. And so when we have an understanding of our gene expression, we can then start interacting with what our body needs in real time. Um, and so this is a, a mock-up, essentially, of what will be coming in the near future, essentially because your neuropsychology and your, um, your social life and your nutrition and your exercise how you plan your day are all going to be related to how you interact with your life. We're going to need some sort of head, heads up display that essentially says, this is what you should be thinking about right now. Uh, this is your morning meeting, but the best thing that you could do is have a green tea before you hit that meeting for these three reasons. Um, I'll order it from a cafe that's just up the road so you can pick it up on the way. This is where personalization of health is going. And it's not just a matter of understanding the overarching picture. That, that expansionist, but it's about understanding the minutia as well. It's these two worlds coming together. And so the personalized paradigm shift essentially involves two aspects. One is that you have to understand the person. You have to understand not whether kale is good. It's about whether kale is appropriate for this individual. Uh, and understanding all of the different facets of this individual is, is what is going to allow us to do that. And that happens through our gene expression because it tells us what genes we have and what genes are turned on so that we can understand, right, what, what are they doing? Um, and, and what do they need right now? What is their state of stress? And, and where do we need to go from there? Uh, so it's that appropriate consideration of comprehensive and integrated settings. And then it is the right context. It is about understanding that it's never the client's fault if they haven't got a result. It is that you don't know how to motivate them or you don't know exactly what, you, what extra you can add into their program that is going to be more aligned with their body in that moment in time. There's no such thing as a disease. There's, there's only such thing as a, a, an imbalanced body. And so when we put the person into the right environment, which is a collective of not just all of the nutrition and exercise and general lifestyle medicine strategies that we have, but it's also their social surroundings, their work, how happy they are there, and even their community can have an influence on their health as well. And so I implore you, um, uh, if, if you're listening to this, to, to have a, a much more thorough look into personalization and not, uh, not 
not risk a person's health based on a generic recommendation that has come from a beautifully designed randomized control trial that has given you an average. You need to be searching for inter-individual difference. You need to be analyzing the difference of this person. You need to notice how their body responds. And if it's not responding, it may not be because of the person's adherence and motivation. It may be because the intervention wasn't completely appropriate to the person. I would say the latter is far more likely. So I wanted to just uh, finish by saying that everything that we are after as health professionals, you know, there is not a person on the planet that doesn't want to eliminate chronic disease and pain by the year or by any time. Our specific mission, what we're doing at PHRE 60 is to eliminate chronic disease and pain by the year 2050. And the only way that that happens is through personalization. Uh, it, it, it will not get there through uh, generic science. It must be personalized and it must take in the whole human, not just one element of their personalization. So thank you very much for the opportunity to speak and I'm, I'm really looking forward to any questions that you have. Hey Cam, that is just um, just fantastic, mate. I, I love love what you do. This is a complete, obviously, paradigm shift. And what I what really resonates with me is it's actually leaning on ancient wisdom. And I really like how you drew that out in in the presentation. So in a moment, we're going to be um, killing the recording, and uh, and then the class who are doing the lifestyle medicine course can stay back, and we'll be be having questions. But for those who are just tuning in, just for the presentation part, if they wanted to learn more about this, what where's the where where do they go to? Oh, that's a good question. So, um, well, there's a number of resources that I can forward to you. So, uh, just for this group uh, right now, in fact, this is going out and being shared. That's okay. Um, uh, probably support at ph360.me. Like that's it's a an, an easy way to get uh, plenty of resources around this. What we've been talking about specifically, everything that I've been presenting on, is essentially the area that we specialize in. Uh, yeah. Is this, so that this was sort of, once again that was so that was support at support at ph360.me um, and. Uh, www.ph360.me is a starting point. It's a, it's a consumer, safe, consumer facing website, uh, but there's sections of science on there that you can read and obviously just jump in touch with me. You can find me on LinkedIn or whatever you like and happy to have a discussion there too. I want to thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, we're about to kill the recording, but just, yeah, it's, it, this, is the, this is the new paradigm and, and what you've shared. It's funny, you know, when you hear it presented in this way, you think, why hasn't everyone been thinking this way for, for, for years? And so obviously it's time has come. So, you know, I really uh, appreciate the work you're doing and just your passion for it is, is very infectious. So uh, keep up the good work.